Well, if you go ahead and please open in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. If you're new to the Bible, there's a table of contents that's actually in front of your Bible, if you didn't know, and they'll show you where the Gospel of Luke is. We're going to be in Luke chapter 9 this morning, which you can find by looking for the big number. So turn to Luke, look for the big number 9. And as you turn there, as I get ready to read God's Word and then preach God's Word, um, we always have a time of prayer for this because we believe this is a holy moment. In my morning of prayer this morning, I, I want to include, and I'm not sure if you might be aware of this because it took place overnight, um, but there were several large churches in Sri Lanka that were attacked yesterday as they gathered for their Easter celebrations. Uh, and the estimates, early estimates looked to be about 200 people that were killed as, as, they, as they gathered to worship. And so we want to pray for them. We want to remember their family. And, uh, and we remind ourselves this is, this is why the hope of the resurrection really matters. This is what keeps Christians in the face of evil from returning in kind, but standing firm in our faith. Um, because we believe that this life is not all there is. But there is a resurrection and there is eternal love that we've experienced. And so we respond to hate with love. But let's just bow our heads and pray for these people in Sri Lanka, and then pray for our service as well. Dear Lord God, as we come this morning, and many of us are here with family and anticipating being with family later on today, there are some who will not have that opportunity because their family was brutally taken from them yesterday. And so Lord, we just want to be, first of all, with the grieving families, and we pray that you would just comfort their hearts. We pray that the hope of Jesus Christ would ring true to them today. That while there's no answer or explanation for why these senseless things happen, there is hope in knowing that this life is not all there is, but there is another life to come. And Jesus, you have shown us that by not staying dead, but rising from the grave. And so I pray now more than ever, the hope of the resurrection would be a comfort to these families. Lord, we pray for the country of Sri Lanka. I don't know what is going on that could possibly cause so much hate towards a group of people. But we pray, Lord God, that you would be with that country, show your mercy upon that country, that you would bring justice, Lord God, to those who perpetrate this act, but not a brutal justice, the justice that would lead them to redemption, Lord God. And so we lift up that country to you. We stand with them in spirit. And we pray that hate would once again be met with love. For that is our response as believers in you. And Lord, as we turn our attention now to the preaching of your word, I pray that you would be with us in this moment. I pray that you would help us, Lord God, to understand what it is that you are speaking to us. I pray that you would meet each one of us right where we're at, but not leave any of us where we're at. May we continue to be changed and transformed by who you are, the God-man, Jesus Christ. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're going to be studying in Luke chapter 9, verse 18 through 22, and as your eyes make your way there and your apps open to there, I'll tell you a brief story. I I actually, one of my jobs that I had at one point was I was an assistant teacher uh, at college, and um, that means that you work under professor and they get all the credit and you do all the work. Um, And so I started that year by by asking the students and saying, make a statement that I think probably every teacher always makes. It's the cliche statement, hey, there's no such thing as a stupid question, right? Um, But I like to stir the pot and I like to get people's attention. And so I asked that and I said said that. I said, there's no such thing as a stupid question. But then I followed up by saying, but there is such a thing as a stupid person. And, And all students immediately got horrified, like, who is this guy and what are we about to be in for? I said that to get their attention because then I said a stupid person is a person who doesn't ask a question. And I was trying to bring home the point that our ability to grow in knowledge, to grow in our understanding, really to grow as human beings, comes from our willingness to ask questions. And the same is true when it comes to faith. Some have said that you shouldn't question faith. You should just have faith as if faith is some kind of blind trust. But that is just not true at all. Faith is based on good questions opening us up to different and new experiences. And we've been going through a series here in the Gospel of Luke. And this is typically what we do here at Christ Church. We we pick one book of the Bible and we go through it section by section so we can get into the grid of it. 
and see what the Bible really says for itself. And as we've been studying Luke, we've seen that it's a biography written by Luke about Jesus. And he wrote this biography for another man named Theophilus, who, like us, wasn't around when Jesus was alive. And so Theophilus, understandably, like we all can, had questions. And so Luke wrote this for him, so that he might have answers to these questions. We, we, we know from Luke chapter 1 verse 4 that his purpose in writing this is so that Theophilus, he says, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. This, this book is written in response to good questions being asked. And Luke wanted to interact with these questions. And so he compiled and eyewitness accounts of people who actually were there with Jesus, people who, who lived with him, people who could still be contacted and collaborate for their evidence. This whole book is about asking questions and having them answered. And as we come to chapter 9 this morning, we see Jesus himself asking a question. We see Jesus asking what is really the question, the fundamental question to every person's life, Every day of our lives. The question that's not answered once and then you move on from, but the question that is something that we are to be living in an ongoing experience of. And so I've been telling this morning's sermon, the question, the question. Let's look at Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 22. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds Say that I am. And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah. And others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Praise God for His holy word. In this section, we see Jesus asking the question. The question of who do you say that I am? There are many questions that we can have, many questions we can have about our faith. But this really is the question that frames every other question. Who is Jesus? Nothing else really matters in this book if we don't answer that question. When we get confused about things that we read here, when we wonder how two things that seem to be untrue could possibly be true together, this is the question that we always come back to. When we go through hard things in life that we can't explain and they make us wonder who God is. This is the question that we come back to. Friends, our faith is not a system of thought. It's not religious ideas. It's not even just a book. Our faith is based on a historical moment that Jesus lived, that he died, and that he rose again. Our faith is based on this question and how we answer this question that Jesus is asking here Who is he? And so I want to look at this question a little bit with you this morning. I want to look at the three sections that these verses are broken up into. And so the first section is this, the confusion of the crowd. The confusion of the crowd. As Jesus asked this question, who do people say that I am? We we see that the crowd is somewhat confused. Right? He, He asks his disciples, who do you think I am? And they give different answers. Now, there's several things that are interesting about this answers, right? They say John the Baptist, they say Elijah, say one of the prophets of old. John the Baptist, if you've been following us, he's been someone who was a contemporary of Jesus, who lived before, just slightly before Jesus, and was executed before Jesus began his public ministry. And so some people thought that Jesus was uh, John the Baptist reincarnate. Other people thought that he was Elijah. Elijah was the greatest prophet of the uh, Old Testament Jews, and it was said that when the day of the Lord comes, the day when God would rescue his people, that Elijah would come as a precursor of that moment. And so some thought that he was Elijah. Other thoughts, they didn't know, want to be tied down to any one specific person, and so they just said, oh, it must be some kind of prophet. But here's what's, several things that are interesting about that. Here's the first thing. 
No one denied that Jesus was different. No one denied that there was something that was, that was extraordinary about this person. Jesus was, by all historical accounts, someone who did incredible, inexplicable things. And so as people were asked the question, they had to come up with some kind of answer because they knew this was not just another ordinary man. They were, they were confused about who he was, but they all knew that he had done some extraordinary things. And this is not just the testimony that we get in Scripture. This is the testimony that we get by people who wrote around the same time. There were other historians who weren't Christians, weren't followers of Jesus, but they report that there was this man, Jesus, and he did extraordinary things. And so Josephus, most famously the one who has written about this, and some of the things he has written has been corrupted over times, as Christians kind of put some stuff in there that Josephus probably didn't say. But there's consensus that he at least said this, around this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, who did surprising deeds. The Roman Celsus um, historian tried to describe these surprising deeds by saying it was by magic that he was able to do the miracles which he appeared to have done. See, not everyone believed that Jesus was God, but no one denied that he did extraordinary things. And I could go on to quote Tacitus and Tertullian and Pliny the Younger and Pliny the Elder, and the list goes on and on about people who wrote about Jesus because Jesus certainly created quite a stir. And so here's Jesus asking his disciples, who is it that people say I am? As they see me doing these extraordinary things, as this stir is being created, who do people say that I am? And they came to differing conclusions. They came to differing conclusions. But here's what's also interesting about their responses. Their differing conclusions all had one common theme. They all sought to identify Jesus as a prophet. Here's what's interesting about that. Jesus never said he was a prophet. Jesus has been very clear from day one of his ministry that he is God. Remember, if you were here from Luke chapter 4, when he gives the first sermon, he opens the scroll and he uses the prophet Isaiah to show how he is God incarnate. And the hometown gets so upset at him because like, wait, you're Joseph's boy. We know your family. And they get angry at him because of the claim that he was making to be God. And so Jesus has been teaching this in a variety of ways, in a multiple ways. Right? Remember the story when he was forgiving the man's sins. And the, the religious leaders like, no one can forgive sins except God alone. And Jesus is like, you're right. Watch me do it. I mean, he's been saying in a million different ways that he is God. If there's one thing that's clear, it's clear that Jesus said that he is God. And yet the crowd is saying, no. The crowd's rejecting that. They're confused about who he is, but they're agreed upon the fact that he can't be God. He must be some kind of prophet. And so think about what they're doing. Think about what they're doing. These are not open-minded people. They see Jesus doing extraordinary things. No one's denying that he's doing extraordinary things. But they don't want to accept his reasoning for why he can do these miracles. They're not open-minded. They're closed off and shut off from anything that doesn't line up with their preformed ideas. They had only one category, prophet. And so they're trying to get Jesus to fit into this category. They try to reason a way into making Jesus fit into what they already thought. How easy it is for us to be like the confused crowd. (laughs) Here in America, right, we take pride on being sophisticated and being open-minded people. But are we truly open? Are we truly willing to consider things that might be outside our experience? You know, people are very comfortable with calling Jesus a good teacher, a good person, maybe some kind of spiritual guru. And yet, not many are as open to his claim to be God. And listen, it's an out there claim. Like, I get it. But he did some out there things. And I think we should at least be open to considering the truthfulness of what he said. The crowd was confused because they weren't open. Jesus ultimately isn't interested in the crowd, though. After asking the crowd, he he locks eyes with his disciples and says, okay, but who do you say that I am? And that leads us to 
section, second section of this, which is the confession. The confession. This, this really is the question. At the end of the day, what the crowd says doesn't matter. It matters what we say, what we believe as individuals. Now, our culture has no problem with this being an individual question, right? Many are perfectly fine with Jesus meaning different things to different people. But, but that really misses the pointedness of Jesus' question. As he hears different people saying different things about who he is, he pointedly says, but who do you say that I am? He's making the point, I can't be both John and I can't be Elijah. I can't be all these different peoples at the same time. Who do you actually say that I am? He's, he's trying to drive them to make a truth statement. In our culture, we've lost belief that there is such a thing as truth. In our spirit of relativity, where each person can make up their own truth, we've lost the idea that there can be things that are just fundamentally true. What gets celebrated is each person being allowed to have their own truth, and we better respect that truth, or we're judging them. Now now listen, Christians should absolutely be about respecting others. Right? We fundamentally believe that everyone has been made by God. And therefore has inherent value and worth and deserves our respect no matter who they are or what they believe. That is 101 for how Christians are meant to be interacting with others. But what's really interesting is that it's a recent phenomenon that all of a sudden respect means that you can't challenge someone's way of thinking. Right? That, That didn't exist as early as maybe 30 years ago. You used to be able to have a conversation with people and disagree about things And they wouldn't feel like you're attacking their personhood. But that doesn't exist anymore. Now, if there's any type of challenge whatsoever, we're no longer affirming. We're we're now judgmental. We're now threatening. But friends, just think about where that has gotten us. If everyone has their own truth, then there's no such thing as truth. I mean, this is what justifies Holocaust deniers. right? They can say there was no Holocaust, and that's their truth. And who are we to say that there's not? Right? This is why it created the horrible phenomenon of fake news. Right? Politicians don't like to get confronted with what they say, and they'll be like, oh, no, I didn't say that. It didn't happen. Fake news. And it's like, I mean, it's just you watch some of these things sometimes, the interaction with the reporters, and they're like, well, listen, I'm actually quoting you. Not misquote, fake news. Um, well, I have a videotape of ah, fake news. I mean, it blows everything off, right? A world that is okay without living with actual truth is a world of chaos with no truth. And Jesus isn't okay with us living in that kind of world. Jesus wants us to believe that there is things that are actually true. And so he asks his disciples this question, what is true? Who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up first. And I love Peter. I feel like he gives hopes to big mouths like me around the world. Um, He always spoke up first. And, uh, and he says, and makes this profound statement in verse 20. He says, you are the Christ of God. The most incredible words that we've heard so far in the Gospel of Luke. Christ means anointed. Peter's a Jew. And for the Jew, they had the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible. And, and in that, that word anointed would get used to talk about kings. And so, for example, their, um, their law says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, it says, you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him, speaking of the king. And so kings were to be anointed. They'd be anointed by oil, and this would be a sign that they had been set apart by God to lead God's people. And so kings were called the anointed ones. They were called Christ. Every king was a Christ in that sense. However, while every king was considered anointed, the Old Testament spoke of a future king coming. A king who would be a king of kings. Not a Christ, but the Christ. And so, for example, the prophet Micah, which gave this prophecy, which often gets read around Christmas time. But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel anointed, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. There's a future Christ coming, a future anointed one who would be from old. Ancient of days is a way of saying from eternity past. Who's the ruler? Who's the Christ who comes from from eternity past? 
Isaiah, the prophet, will go on to explain in Isaiah chapter 9. Again, another famous Christmas passage. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government should be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And so this coming king would be born into human history, and yet he would be from ancient of days. He he would be a child, and yet somehow also he would be mighty God. And and he would establish a kingdom which would have no end. And how does the kingdom go on for eternity? Only when it's established by someone who is eternal. And so what is very clear from the prophets is that there is a day coming when Not just another Christ would come, not just another king, but the king to end all kings, the king who would be the eternal king, who would set up his eternal throne, who would be from ancient of days past and would rule for all eternity. There was the Christ coming. And that is who Peter is saying that Jesus is. Not a Christ, but the Christ of God. As Peter's been with Jesus... And has seen Jesus do things like stop a storm with his voice. As he has seen Jesus raise a dead girl to life. As he has heard Jesus teach and forgive sins and preach. And just quietly, quite frankly saw him live. His conclusion is there is only one explanation. Jesus is this foretold Christ. Jesus is the only person in all history whose birth was anticipated. Only person in all in history whose life was foretold before he even came. And Peter, as he sees Jesus, he says, this is who you are. In many ways, the whole book of Luke has been building to this point. This isn't new information to us that Jesus is the Christ. We were told in chapter 1 by the narrator that Jesus is the Christ. And then we are told in chapter 2, we heard the angels declare it to the shepherds. We've seen a couple times that even the demons call Jesus this title. But this is the first time that a person actually confesses it. This is the first time that the truth about Jesus is clearly and definitively stated out of a human mouth from a human heart. This is a climactic moment. This is where this whole narrative has been building up until this point. The confession that Jesus is truly the Christ of God. And yet the climax of this moment is juxtaposed with something that is so odd and in many ways is meant to be jarring. Right, Peter says this, he he finally gets it, he makes the right confession, but then in verse 21, Jesus responds by It says, he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one. It's like, that's not what you expect at this point. It's like, why? Why would you do this? Why keep this under wraps? Someone finally got it. You know, isn't the whole point about Jesus coming, that people are to know that there is a God, and now that there is someone who is ready to testify that Jesus is God? Shouldn't this be, hey, let's put this message on blast and get it out there? Why the command for silence? Well, Peter was right to call Jesus the Christ. But his understanding at this point is incomplete. His confession of faith needed some important clarification. And that takes us to the third section, the clarification. Remember, Christ means anointed. And so, for Peter, he's thinking king. And that's why from this point on, the disciples are going to be continually asking Jesus, hey, when's your kingdom coming? When's your kingdom coming? When are you going to do this? They're thinking that Jesus had come to be this king that would deliver them from the Roman rulers. They thought Jesus had come to be the king who was going to wreck shop, kill their enemies, and deliver the people of Israel. That's what they had in mind as they said the Christ. But Jesus wants to, them to think something else. And so he goes on to clarify by telling them in verse 22... The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. 
Oh, Jesus is the Christ. He doesn't correct Peter for calling him that. But he's not the Christ that the disciples expected. He didn't come to kill, but to be killed. Not to deliver from enemies, but to be delivered over to his enemies. Jesus teaching that there's a long, hard road ahead for him. And, and notice, he doesn't say these things are just going to kind of happen to him. Hey, you know, I, I look through the quarters of time and just want you to know these, these things are going to happen. No, he says, verse 22, the Son of Man must. He taught that these things were going to occur because of necessity. When Jesus goes before Pilate, the Roman ruler, and Pilate says, don't you have any defense to make for yourself? Don't you know that I hold your life in my hands? Jesus says, no, you don't. No one can take my life from me unless I choose to lay it down. You see, Peter knew the prophets about the Christ, but he didn't put together the prophecies of the suffering servant. So the Old Old Testament does speak speak about the Christ to come, but it also speaks about the sufferer who would come and would suffer on behalf of God's people. It takes place all over the place. I'll just give you two. Psalm 22, verses 1 and 6. My God, my God, why are you forsaken me? Jesus quoted scripture on the cross as he cries that out. My God, my God, why are you forsaken me? He goes on to say, I'm a worm and I'm not a man. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people. Isaiah 53, 53, verses 3 and 4. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. See, the Old Testament spoke about the suffering servant who would come and would, would take the judgment for sin upon himself. And in verse 22, Jesus is showing Peter that, yes, he is the Christ, but he is also the suffering servant. Right? That's why he says he must do this. He didn't come just to fulfill the prophecies of the Christ. He came to fulfill the prophecies of the sufferer. And he emphasizes this by changing the title that he's being addressed as. In verse 20, Peter uh, 19, excuse me, verse 19, Peter says, you're the Christ. And then in verse 21, Jesus calls himself what? The Son of Man. Now again, we have to get some Old Testament in order to understand what this title means. That, that phrase, Son of Man, gets used 104 times in the Old Testament. And each one of those references, except one, is a direct reference to either a specific person or a group of people. And so, and so by, by Jesus identifying himself as the Son of Man, what Jesus is making very clear is that he is human. He is he's identifying with Peter. He's identifying, he's identifying with us. us. So in order to bear our griefs, carry our sorrows, be wounded for our sins, be crushed for our judgment, Jesus had to be one of us. He had to be part of humanity in order to offer himself on behalf of humanity. But him, but him being one of us wasn't enough. enough. Because as God's, God's word says, and God's word can never be broken, in Psalm 49, 7, says, Truly no man can ransom another, or, or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly. Like no, no person can offer themselves, themselves for another person. One, one life can't buy another life, because life, life just isn't worth that much. And so, and so Jesus, Jesus just being human would not be enough. Because, because no man can reigns in the life of another's. And so, and so as Jesus calls himself Son of Man, yes, he is absolutely, absolutely identifying himself with us in our humanity. But, but if you remember, I said there were 104 references. 103, 103 of them are to humanity, but there's, there's one, one that is different. There's one, there's one that comes to us in the book, the book of Daniel. Daniel. As, the as the prophet Daniel, Daniel says, says this in chapter 7, I saw the night visions. And behold, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, of heaven there, there came one like a son of man. man. And he came to the ancient days and was presented before him. And to him, him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. 
In this, in this vision, Daniel sees, sees the Son of Man coming before the Ancient of Days, days which is another word for God. And the, the Son of Man is given an everlasting kingdom. kingdom. And so, and so he, he must be an everlasting being. being. And there should be bringing in our minds. We should be connecting Daniel 7 with Isaiah chapter 9. As Isaiah said, the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. God's kingdom is the only kingdom where there is no end. There's only one person who rules in God's kingdom, and that is God himself. And so this Son of Man in Daniel 7 is clearly God. And so as Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, on the one hand, he is identifying with us, but on the other hand, he is simultaneously showing that he is God. He's making a statement that he is the God-man. While only, only man can suffer, suffer for mankind's sin, sin only, only God's life, life is actually enough to pay, pay for mankind's sin. sin. And so Jesus is the man who identifies with us and dies in our place, and he's the God whose death is enough to cover our judgment of death. Jesus is filling out for Peter and for us what it means for him to be the Christ. He is, he is the Christ, the Christ, Son, Son of Man, the God, God Man. And so, and so he says, says that he must, must do these things. And what, what a precious, precious word that word must is. is. Why did Jesus, Jesus come to suffer and be rejected and die? Why did he say he must, must do that? that? Well, yes, well, yes, it was to fulfill a prophecy. But why, why were those prophecies even made? made? Why, why did God put this plan into motion? God God's of the Lord, Lord. but he gave his one and only Son. And whoever, and whoever believes in him might, might not perish, but might have everlasting life. Friends, Friends there, there is so much love behind that, that word, must. Jesus, Jesus said he must for you and for me. We heard on Good Friday when Jesus was hanging on the cross, there was a Crowd of people who gathered at his feet and taunted him to come down and save himself. He stayed up there because he must. He stayed up there because he could not save himself and save us at the same time. And so the divine love of the must steals his heart and he continued to adore all the cross as we should have been on our church. The cross, cross is not something, something that happened to Jesus. The cross, the cross is something Christ Jesus chose. And he said he must make that choice. choice. Because, because it is God's, God's will that sinners, sinners like you and me not, not have to pay, pay for their sins. God's, God's justice will not allow God, God to turn a blind eye to sin, sin but his love could not, not let us see the judgment that we rightly deserve for our sin. sin. And, and so God sent Jesus. And Jesus, and Jesus said, he must. These, These things were not optional, but his, his suffering on our behalf came out of divine, divine necessity born of holy love. love. Friends, Friends, if you, if you are, are here and you have placed your faith in Jesus, there's, there's one, one thing you can know about anything, anything else in the world, world right, right now, is that you are loved, loved by God. God. Amen. Jesus when we saw, saw you, you said, said, I must. And we're loved by God, by God not because there's anything, anything inherently good, good in us. We know, we know ourselves, ourselves too well, for them, don't we? Yeah. We're, we're sinners. sinners. People, people fail. People, people mess, mess up. up. And yet God's, God's holy love who looked at us still said, I must. Friends, it has been said, said the cross is the hope in which God, which God preached, preached his greatest sermon. sermon. And, and it is the empty tomb that gives validity to it. Without the empty tomb, the story at this point is not, not a story that should make us feel anything other than sadness, sadness over another, another senseless death. But with, with the empty tomb, the cross is not, not just a death, but becomes, but becomes a definitive statement, statement on the love of God. God. Because, because it shows that there is a God. God. It shows, it shows that Jesus, Jesus is who he says he is. It's the tomb that validates everything. 
Without Without it, there's nothing nothing, but with it, we have everything. This is why why Jesus Jesus told Peter Peter not to speak yet yet about him him being the Christ. Christ. See, Peter knew that Jesus is the Christ, and he was correct in that statement. But he didn't understand how Jesus had come to die and rise again. And so he didn't get the heart of the message of what is God's love for us. Jesus, Peter, Peter couldn't share about, about Jesus. He was told not, not to speak at all because he didn't get, get Jesus really yet. yet. And so, so I think this text really asks us, us the question this morning. Do we, do we get Jesus? Do we, do we get Jesus? Something, Something we say here every single Sunday, Sunday is at this church, the safe place, place for people to come, for not yet believers, believers to be able to come to explore and ask questions. questions. But, but whatever, whatever questions, questions you might have this morning, that's you. you. This, this really, really is the question. question. People want to dive into questions about, about you know, creation, creation versus evolution. evolution. Lots, Lots of great, great conversation about that. We can talk about that. My take, my take is, is that the Bible is vague, so there's room for interpretation. But that's, that's not, not really the question. question. This is the question. This is the question. The question I was talking with someone earlier this week, and they were asking, the age-old question, question that's been asked, why, why, why do good, good bad, bad things happen to good people? people. That's, that's a hard, hard question, question, especially when it's personal. personal. But this, this is the, the question, question that must frame that question. Who is Jesus? Jesus? Right? Right? Until, Until you answer, answer this question, question of who is Jesus, no other question really makes sense. sense. Why am I trying to figure, figure out how good God, God can also allow these things to happen? You don't believe Jesus is God, what difference does it make? Right, why, why try to reconcile, reconcile God's, God's sovereignty and our human choice? choice? It, doesn't it doesn't make a difference if Jesus is truly God. Why, why I try to think about is the Bible true or not? It doesn't, it doesn't matter if Jesus is isn't really God. Friends, Friends we, we have to understand, understand our faith, faith boils down to this question, question is Jesus really God? God? That, that is the most fundamental question that we have to wrestle with. And as we think about how to wrestle this, really what that question is boils down to even more is how do you explain an empty tomb? History, history forces, forces that you must pause an answer to that question. You can't, you can't dodge, dodge it. For years, For years people have been trying to come up with alternative theories to it. But even those theories, theories continue to explain the point that there's, there's no, no corpse on earth, earth right now that is identified as Jesus Christ. Christ. The very, the very fact, fact that there are many theories prove that this, this is a question that must be looked at. Yeah. Recently, the most recent theory I heard was that, that well, he's probably, probably putting some kind of common grave, grave his body, body just got lost. lost. And it's amazing. amazing. I feel we get dumber sometimes as we go on. on. Um, because, because that just shows you haven't read, read, read any kind of history. history. If you, you read history in the first century, century again, outside of the Bible, Bible extra biblical resources, um, it, shows it shows that the prevailing theory at that time was that someone had stolen Jesus' body. Now, if Jesus' body had just been lost, couldn't they have just said that? Hey, you, hey, you guys think God rose from the dead? Like, who knows? You know, you know? like, even then, like, it'd be so, so easy to disprove that, that if Jesus' body had just, body just been lost. lost. Or, or, or it also would have been easy to disprove it. They're saying Jesus, Jesus rose from the dead. What's the easiest way to disprove that? Produce the corpse. Right? The fact that they had to create a story that had been stolen proves what? There's no body. There's no body. And so they came up with a story that the disciples stole the body. Again, Again, I think well, we, have we have to really, really think about that. Could that, that have happened? happened? Perhaps. Well, let's, let's remember who these disciples, disciples were. were. In, a, in a, the, first the first century, it became a crime, crime to say that Jesus rose from the dead. It was considered it was blasphemy against God for the, for the Jews, and it was considered an act, an act of treason, treason for, the for the Romans. And so, so if you taught for the resurrection, you were in prison, beaten, and killed. All of Jesus' disciples would go on to be, to be executed, executed for their, their resur- belief in Jesus' resurrection. <laughs> and so, and so could, could they have stolen the body? Perhaps could they have made this all up? Certainly. But think, think about, about, you know, when people lie, why, why do they usually do that? that? In, order in order to get something, something good, good out of it. Right. Like, who, who makes, makes something up? I'm going to make this up. The reason I'm going to do it is because I'm going to die. I mean, just think about that. It makes, it makes no, no sense whatsoever. whatsoever. Like, if I'm, I'm lying about something, if you put, put a gun to my head, guess, guess what? what? All of a sudden, I'm not going to continue to lie that thing. Hey, listen, yo, you believe, believe Jesus really rose from the dead? You've got to deny that right now. I've got the corpse in the back trunk. I'm hopping the trunk. Here's the keys. Sorry about that. You know, Peter was off doing his thing again. He made me do it. I'm out. But 
But no, the disciples did that. Let's remember, we're not talking about 11 people. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah, this is a fact of history. As early as 30 years after Jesus died, Again, Tacitus would record in his history, history that the gospel, gospel went all the way to Rome and that there were hundreds, hundreds of Christians being killed on a regular basis for belief, belief that they had seen, seen the risen Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. And so, so we have to grapple, grapple with, with this question. question. Did, did somehow, somehow thousands, thousands of people go crazy? Or did, or did something actually happen? happen? History forces us to ask this question. question. How, How do we explain that the tomb, tomb and, what and what does that show us about who we believe that Jesus is. is. And listen, and listen friends, I'm asking this question. This is not just a question for people who are exploring the Christian faith. faith. This, this is, is a question for us as Christians as well. Because let's, let's be honest, as we go through life, we have different questions that come up sometimes. We can have questions about our faith. We can go through hard things. We can go through things that test our faith. We can Read things, things in here that don't make sense, sense sometimes. sometimes. Let me tell you something, something right now. now. You, you say, say, well, the Bible, Bible says it, and so, so I believe it, and that, that ends it? it. That's, That's not, not the answer the Scripture would give. Because the Bible, the Bible says, says that Jesus has been raised, and we're still in our sins. Our faith is in vain, and we're all people who should be Why do we believe this book? Not just because it's a book that says it's the Word of God, because Jesus came and lived and died and rose again, and He said this is the Word of God. Friends, it, it all comes, comes back, back to the resurrection. resurrection. Yeah. It, all it all comes back, back to the resurrection. When we have, have questions about our faith, faith. we can struggle with people when we read in here, when we can wonder and grapple and how do we work these things out. out. It comes back to who is Jesus. If he is just a man, then stop wasting your time. But if he is Lord, we must fall to our knees and submit our lives to him. It's, it's not, not that, that we don't have questions, questions. It's, it's not that we won't go through hard things, things. But, but this is, is what, what we hold on to. to. This, this is what defines us. This, this is what stays our descent when we're going in the dark spiral of doubt that can plague us all sometimes. This is what to keep us. I don't know if anything else is real other than the fact that the tomb of Jesus is empty. And because of that, I know that everything is wrong. It all, it all comes back, back to the resurrection. It all comes back to this question that Jesus asks, and then he answered on Easter, Easter. Who do you say he is? He is, he is the risen Lord. That, that is who he says he is. When we bank our lives on that, that can change everything about us.